We are definitely live in person. We're also potentially, hopefully, live streaming online. We had a really good, strong outpouring of uh, likes on Facebook and other social media platforms. So dare I say, I'm not sure if there's a number for this, but I think we might have gone viral. Um, so uh, <laughs> we're excited to have uh, streaming access uh, throughout the 2018 uh, series of, the, uh, of our Autism 200 lectures. Um, uh, this um, month, we're doing it via Blue Jeans. Um, uh, hopefully, it's going to work out for everybody. We're still trying to work out the kinks in terms of uh, how uh, it gives the people who are streaming ability to kind of interact and ask questions. Uh, so try and be patient with us on, on that. Uh, for people in the audience here, <coughs> um, uh, for the nice broadcast uh, produced episode tonight, leave your questions until the end. Uh, they'll be going through a nice script here. Uh, again, if you do ask questions at the end, still make sure you're leaving those questions uh, without patient health information, since this is both streaming and uh, recorded. So keep that all in mind. Um, and uh, we still have no exit that way. So if you're here in person, don't go that way if there's a fire alarm. Um, other than that, I uh, hope we have a good evening. Um, and without further ado, momentarily, we're going to kick it over to, wait for it. Good evening, and welcome to 2018 State of Autism. I'm Jim Mancini. And I'm Rafe Bernier. This is our opportunity to talk about things that happened over the last year and maybe take a look forward at what we might be able to expect in 2018. Indeed. Yeah. And let's start with a little bit of science, Jim. All right, sounds great. Uh, of course, if we're going to talk about science, I'm going to start with my favorite part about science, which is genetics. All right. Uh, so what we do is I'll talk a little bit about some of the big findings this past year regarding uh, insight into the genetics of autism. So one of the large findings from this past year in 2017 was the uh, use of whole genome sequencing technology to really interrogate what's happening in autism. And just to sort of provide a little background for what I'm talking about when I talk about whole genome sequencing. When we think about all of our DNA, we've got a whole bunch of different uh, uh, little base pairs scattered throughout our, our DNA. And portions of these little base pairs form together to form uh, genes and the coding information for genes. Mm -hmm. Now, we, we sort of lump these little groups that form genes, and we call these exons. And that's compared to uh, the parts that we don't exactly have a full grasp for understanding what these all these little base pairs are doing. We call those introns. We're gaining some insight, but mm -hmm. uh, still don't have the same sort of under understanding that we do of genes. So. Uh, I really want to run over there and point on that, but I'm going to stay seated in my seat, Jim, for you. So, right, so if we, an example might be the uh, all the exons, all those parts that contain our gene coding regions, are that little slice of the apple there. See that little slice of the apple, where the introns and all the other parts of our genome are the rest of the apple. So, what we understand in the coding part of our DNA that codes those genes is just a very small snippet of all the DNA we have embedded in the nucleus of each cell. Mm -hmm. So. For a long time, for the past seven years, we've been able to use whole exome sequencing to understand, well, what genes are involved in, in autism. This past year, what we did is we actually took that to the next level by looking at all of the genome. We looked at all those little, all the introns, all those sections that don't code for genes, and said, well, what do those do? And how might those be different, these regions in, in autism? And so I'm going to summarize a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of work into one short sentence. And uh, uh, essentially what the work in whole genome sequencing in autism did this past year was find, find that children with autism have more de novo, that is spontaneous or newly arising changes in these intron sections, these, uh, these sections that aren't coding for genes, uh, compared to their siblings and compared to other kids who don't have autism. Uh, sorry, yes, who, who don't have autism. And so the particular things that those regions, really these introns are, region, these introns are doing, these regions, what those areas that are changed, these mutations, these de novo mutations, what those things are doing is they change the way genes function, the way they, they operate uh, in terms of when they turn on, when they turn off, uh, how they're expressed. Mm -hmm. So that becomes really important in thinking about, well, we now are, we have an understanding of what the genes are that are impacting autism, and now we're finding there's all sorts of other variants that don't even impact the gene, but impact the way that gene is expressed and where it's expressed in the brain. Mm -hmm. And that becomes very important as we think about uh, the regions of the gene of, of our brain and our body, where these genes and where these uh, variants that impact the genes are expressed. So we've got a couple uh, slides here, for, um, a couple images from uh, this paper that came out in 2017. And uh, on the top right there, 
we show is these are all the different particular uh, uh, tissues in the body where the genes that, that, uh, that all our genes are, are expressed. And highlighted in red there, you can see that th uh, that's the brain. And that's where the majority of the tissues where these uh, de novo events are, that they're impacted. So the genes that are, that are impacted by these de novo events, they're expressed primarily in the brain. When you dig and that's great, great. We've known that for a while. That's nothing new. That's nothing exciting. So what's exciting about this? When you delve down deeply into what these de novo variants and how they're impacting the genes, where those genes are specifically expressed in the brain is we're getting some insight. It's very difficult to see from this slide, but really what we're seeing, the, the expression primarily is in the, uh, the striatum, mm -hmm. the ventral striatum, which is a part of the brain that's really involved in how our uh, how our brains understand and process reward and reinforcement. Uh, it's also a part of the brain that's tied to the basal ganglia, which we've long known has been implicated in movement uh, disorders, uh, as well as uh, other challenges like ADHD and, and, um, uh, and Tourette's syndrome. So uh, interesting and new information about where in the brain these particular genes that we identify with autism, how, they're being, how and where they're being expressed. So that becomes really exciting. I'm going to stop talking about the science for just a second, Jim, because I know you're starting to sort of zone out a little bit, and that's okay. I do I'm just glad we started with the easy stuff first. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Right. So, so to, why this is important is because we now can understand that we've made all this in, uh, insight in, uh, in inroads in understanding the particular genes that are involved. And now we're starting to understand that all these other parts of the genome that we haven't known what they're doing, we see and understand that what they're doing is they're impacting the way these genes are expressed and where they're being expressed. And specifically for autism, where they're being expressed in particular parts of the brain um, that are involved in reinforcement and how we assign reward and, and valence. Mm -hmm. So just to bring that into behavior, we might think that might be what's contributing to sometimes um, children with autism have very intense interests mm -hmm. that are uh, they're rewarded by things that might seem a little bit atypical, um, or their typical interests that are really in, in intense that might be tied to this reward system mm -hmm. uh, and the way these genes are expressed in this part of the brain. All right. I'm going to stop there, Jim. There we go. Okay. 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 <laughs> Moving on. Uh, this year in Washington, there was the Department of Health finalized um, official licensure for uh, applied behavior analysis, BCBAs, board certified behavior analysts in our state. And this was a long time coming. And it, what, the re, the, one of the reasons it was done and one of the hopes was that it was going to increase the ability for uh, families to uh, access ABA services. More insurance would be covering uh, ABA, we'd be getting more ABA therapists here in our state. And, you know, to some point that has happened. However, uh, still in Washington, we've got a lot of problems, a lot of, a lot of difficulty for people accessing ABA services. Uh, there's still a much higher need uh, than there is the availability. And especially when you move outside of Seattle, move outside of more uh, metropolitan areas. There's not as enough uh, BCBAs out in rural areas. Uh, there's not enough who provide uh, uh, services for linguistically diverse families. And there's not enough uh, who uh, have a real specialty in disruptive behavior. Um, one thing that we can anticipate in 2018, and there's been a lot of uh, talk about, is uh, having more ABA services provided in schools. So there's uh, some of our friends at the Washington Autism Advocacy Alliance have been really pushing this. So that's something that to look forward to uh, a, 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 a wider discussion around that. Um, related to some of this issues around ABA and disruptive be behavior, uh, there were some changes this year to uh, services provided for the, from the Developmental Disability Administration. Uh, one was that uh, one of the changes is related to children with behavioral difficulties and uh, the decrease or the, 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 uh, the uh, ending of uh, waiver programs in our state that have, that are designed to uh, help with challenging behavior. And the, the rationale behind this is, you know, coming from in the federal government is that uh, now in, in our state, ABA is covered by insurance, so uh, that's where uh, families should be receiving these services. However, that there has there is uh, some issues ar around that. So um, you know we need to learn more about 
some of these changes in DDA. And you know, we have somebody here who uh, is going to be able to provide us a little bit more information. Mm. So we have Katrina Davis. Mm. He's a family uh, support specialist at the Seattle Children's Autism Center. And we're going to chat with her a little bit about yeah. some of these, these uh, what DDA is and some of the changes. That sounds wonderful. All so right. Katrina will be meeting you at the fern then? We'll move. understand what's happening. Okay, we're, great. we're right here. You know, where the ferns are between us. Okay. <laughs> so, here you go, like that. So, and just make sure that click is on. Thank you, Jim and Grace. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about Developmental Disabilities Administration, or I'll call it DDA. It's an important topic for families and individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. So, DDA is um, a service that's available to individuals with intellectual or developmental disabilities. And um, I'm going to talk about those behavior supports cuts to waivers. But first, I thought I would set things up by talking about what DDA is, mm -hmm. so people can wrap their head around that. Um, if there's people from outside our region or other parts of the country, every state has a DDA, OK? It might be a different title, but it's a state and federal service. So um, before I cut, uh, crack open that behavior supports challenge that we're going to have, I'm going to move through some slides to help make things clear about DDA. All right. OK. And I provided links for everybody. We're going to move fast, but there's links on every page in case you want to dive in deeper, OK? All right, so DDA, next slide, um, uses state and federal money to provide services and supports for eligible people uh, for developmental disability services. Services can include Maybe you get assigned a, you, you will get assigned a case manager, uh, the individual and the family. You might get hours for personal care hours. Maybe somebody comes to the home, helps with uh, skills of daily living, toileting, bathing, dressing, eating. Uh, there might be respite care for the family, so the mom, dad, or caregiver can take a break. There's access to community services, so that might mean services, equipment, funds, to help that individual access their community, to make it equal, to make the playing ground level and fair. Um, and it also long-term employment supports, housing. So it's a nice net that exists for individuals uh, with developmental disabilities. Um, you know, our, our, our advocates, our parents, our self-advocates, community members, professionals have worked really hard over the years to um, convince our elected officials to find the money and mm -hmm. use the money for these services. But not too long ago, there was a really dark period in our DDA history where there was a wait list of people, about 16,000 individuals mm -hmm. out of about 30,000 or so in our state, about 30,000 or so individuals eligible for DDA, they meet criteria, but there were no services for a long, long time. Well, the good news is, a bit of good news for 2008 plus, last couple years they found some money. They, meaning our government, people fought hard for it. There's, there's now waivers and services available, so I'll tell you what's available. So that's good news. So despite the bad news about cuts to behavior supports, DDA does have capacity to provide some qualified individuals waivers and a program called Community First Choice. So how would parents and individuals apply for these services? Good question. Kind of a complex thing, and it's really important information to share with the community. Um, there are several qualifying conditions for DDA, but let's just crack open the one about autism. There's other categories, epilepsy, intellectual disability other things like that. Um, but this one's just about autism. So in, aut in the world of autism, if the individual has an autism diagnosis, um, they need to have a DSM-4 or DSM-5 diagnosis. They have to have a certain severity level. If it's DSM-5 of two or three, which means it's more severe symptoms of autism, they have to be diagnosed by a qualified person, meaning that someone DDA recognizes. So it could be a developmental pediatrician, a psychiatrist, a psychologist, a neurologist, a nurse practitioner. So once they get that diagnosis from that individual, they also need to show that the individual's IQ is under 85 or that their adaptive skills are under 70. And our schools many times do these two tests. So a lot of times parents will collect that data from the school and submit it with the, with the application, the DDA application. The application's online. And um, I do tell people, call DDA and ask for help if you get stuck on that application. Some really great people there that want to get your child or you into the system. So, okay. Um, so yeah, you can apply online. And I do recommend that people include all those documents as opposed to letting DDA try and track them down. Okay. Yep. And when it comes to some of the services that mm -hmm. an individual or family might receive if they were deemed eligible for DDA? Good question, Jim. My next slide will tell you that. So if, you're, if you are an individual is uh, eligible for services, meets criteria, then um, there's, a, there's a waiver, there's waivers, and there's also a, what's called community first choice, kind of two buckets or pockets of money. 
Um, the, the waivers, there's several of them, as you can see. Um, there's five. And uh, many, most individuals who are new to the DDA system now start with the IFS waiver, Individual Family Support Waiver, okay? And that waiver is based on need and, and severity. All DDA services are based on need and condition, not income. That's important to know. A lot of people say, oh, I can't apply for DDA. My child wouldn't qualify. We have too much money. It's not based on income, okay? Medicaid is, as you might know. But so that's, that's kind of good to know because if you, you give them the IFS waiver, um, depending on the child or the individual's needs, you'll get a pocket of money to buy things. And that handout there describes some of the things you can buy in that blurry little handout there. But that website has a lot of information on what you can get if you get on this waiver. Okay, um, you guys there with this waiver was, um, it, it had a certain amount of spaces and we filled them up this year, but I've been assured by DDA they're gonna continue to make spots. So if you are on the fence or you've never applied, now would be a good time in case we don't want those dark days to come back. They might, we don't know. All right, okay, so um, newly enrolled individuals will most likely be put on the IFS waiver. So if you go to the next slide, um, just that this is interesting for people, oh, Let's see, I think, David, can you go back one? Yeah, that's, um, that's, that's all the waivers and all the individuals in, in 2017. So you can see there's 2,655 individuals in our state on a waiver. Look at that, 9,000 of them are still on the no paid services list. That means those individuals, parents or their caregivers might not know that there's paid services now. So I'm gonna be a big mouth about this all the time and say, if you're on the no paid services list, call DDA and ask for paid services. Or spread the word that there's finally funding, okay? Important. All right, next slide. Second program that a uh, person would qualify for is Community First Choice. This is sort of the Medicaid, pro this is the Medicaid program. So the, the great thing about uh, the Community First Choice is, let's say you're an individual and you're in, you, you're in the DDA system and you have private insurance, mm -hmm. right? Um, through Boeing or through your, the mom or dad's employer or through private insurance. And some parents say, well, I, I wouldn't mind being on Medicaid because there, that does open some doors for services. So once you get in DDA and you get on a waiver, you get this program too, and that's Community First Choice. That's a Medicaid program, so the child's automatically on Medicaid. They're double covered. They will have primary insurance and they'll have Medicaid. That's a nice insurance. It picks up co-pays. Some private insurance doesn't cover ABA, right? Medicaid does, even though there's long wait lists. Um, so that's, it's important to, you know, if, if you're uh, wanting to know some of the benefits of DDA, it opens doors, double click, to <laughs> Medicaid. Medicaid. Okay, right, thank, thank you. you, all right. Um, <laughs> All right, so um, uh, let's see. Are there other updates, other changes yes, to DDA? Yes, there is other updates, <laughs> and I'll make this quick. This is important to know about DDA. So a few bullet points here. I'll run through these. That waiver I was telling you about, the one that most people get on now if they're new to DDA, we talked about it. It's not reach, It has reached capacity, but they're going to open it up some more. So keep applying. Tell people to apply. That cuts to behavior supports that you talked about. Mm -hmm. That was a heartbreaker this year for a lot of families. So these waivers used to cover behavior supports. So if you have a child who's disruptive, maybe challenging behaviors, self-injury, things that kind of get the, the big guns of behavior supports, that used to be covered by the waivers. And to many people's heartbreak, including a lot of fine people at DDA, this decision was made not by DDA, but by the Center for Medicaid Services, so a federal decision. Federal Lots of sad people about that. So what we do now is we just tell parents and caregivers and those seeking those services, to work with your case manager at DDA, to work with your insurance, and be pleasantly persistent to get on those wait lists and call and call and call, okay? Um, there are wait lists and it can be challenging. Um, another um, common issue for our families is the lack of caregivers. So if you've got respite hours or caregiver hours, there's not a lot of caregivers out there right now and there's a lot of shortage and a lot of parents um, suffering from not being able to have that help in the home and individuals who aren't getting the support they need. Mm -hmm. Uh, Non-English non speaking families are disproportionately affected by the complexity of these systems, and DDA is one of them. Mm -hmm. DDA does offer interpreters, they have materials translated, but it's still a complex system to navigate, and it does disproportionately affect our multicultural non-English speaking families. And then um, our folks, individuals seeking out of home placement, maybe want to find housing. There's a housing crisis in our area, mm -hmm. so housing has become a real issue. So, so even some individuals who want to be placed out of the home or that want out of the home are having a hard time. Mm -hmm. And lastly, parents and individuals just not understanding the complexity of DDA. It's a hard system to navigate, and it does limit people's access. So on the next slide, just... Um, um, yeah, where yeah. can people go, <laughs> you know, if, you know, they need more information, advocacy support, uh, and to resolve conflicts? Okay, so lastly, um, we do have some agencies in our region that, that help our individuals and families in the state. We have a new uh, developmental disabilities ombuds. So ombuds are meant to help people resolve conflicts, advocate, learn their rights. We ha now have one for DDA. Mm -hmm. 
brand new. So that's the D Developmental Disability Ombuds with a beautiful new logo. We have the ARC of King County or any ARC of your county. They do amazing work for legislative advocacy and understanding the power of getting involved with advocacy. We have the Washington Autism Advocacy Group that does amazing work around autism and insurance coverage and just navigating autism and just rights and justice for autism. We have Open Doors for Multicultural Families, which is a, is a gem in our community serving families who, uh, who don't speak English or who have multicultural background that maybe limits or b is a barrier to services. Right. And then I do like to spread the word about a group called Informing Families. Their job is to just make all these systems, especially DDA, more clear. So they have a lot of great handouts, videos, things like that. Okay? Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much, Katrina. You're welcome. Back to you, Rafe. Thanks, Katrina. Let's, uh, let's jump back to science for a moment. Is it, no, that's exciting, actually, yeah, everyone. That's, just, we, that's, that's, that's want, cool. Everybody. That's cool. Science is cool. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about some other cool things that emerged this past year. Uh, and I'm going to show, start by showing you a very complex figure here. I'm going to walk us through it. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about SCN2A, which is a gene um, that we've actually known a lot about for, we've known a lot about SCN2A, this gene, for quite a while. But only in the past couple years have we started to understand SCN2A and its relationship to autism. So right now, SCN2A is actually the most common single gene that's been identified through exome sequencing uh, as likely playing a causal role in autism. It accounts for about somewhere between 0.25 and 0.3% of all individuals who have autism have a disruptive variant to SCN2A. So you might hear, wow, that sounds like a very small amount. And that is true. That is a very small amount. And that is the single most common gene tied to autism, which just highlights the complexity of uh, the causes of autism. But I'm not here to talk about that right now, Jim. I want to talk specifically about what we do know about SCN2A. So if we look over here on the left side of the figure, we've got a schematic of a, uh, a, a brain cell, a neuron. And we've got the, the cell body there uh, down at the bottom. Uh, and we've got, uh, at the very bottom of that, we've got SCN2A highlighted there. Now what SCN2A does, it's a gene that codes for a protein that is embedded in our uh, brain cell's wall. And it allows particular types of ions to pass through that cell wall and create action and activity in that particular cell. It really allows for a cell to, to activate and then communicate with other cells or turn on and off uh, eventually other sort of genes and things and activities that happen in that cell. Now what have we've learned just recently about SCN2A is that the type of variant that happens, the type of change that happens to that particular gene, that that impacts the protein that it creates, that, that protein in the cell wall in a different way. And there's a very different outcome for, uh, for the disruption to that particular protein. So on the right hand side we've got a very uh, complicated picture of what that protein looks like that's, uh, that the gene codes for. Uh, and really, uh, all it is is to show that that protein looks kind of cool. And if you're a neuroscientist, you're really excited about that. But we're not going to talk that much about that particular <laughs> okay. image. Um, uh, no, we can still go back though, David. We still we can still talk about it. <laughs> so, so essentially, what we've learned just in the past year is that. Uh, if an individual has a disruptive event that happens to uh, this particular channel, uh, SCN2A, uh, there's one, one type of effect is that it, it creates uh, an impasse of that, of that uh, uh, the protein in the cell wall so that the ions don't pass through that, that cell wall. When that happens, what we've uh, identified is we now find that that type of impact where the ions aren't passing the cell wall, that, that what ends up happening is that individual goes on to develop uh, autism. In contrast, if there's a variant to that particular gene that makes that protein have a, a wider opening so that more ions are flowing through, what we end up seeing is we see a very, very early onset epilepsy that happens within the first one, two uh, days of life. Mm. Uh, and it's, it's intractable, it's very difficult to, to treat, and, um, uh, and is pretty challenging. Uh, so same particular gene, same gene, very different types of effects, all based on how it interacts with the protein. So there's been a lot of focus on this particular gene because it starts to provide an avenue for us to start to think about precision medicine in autism. Mm -hmm. And that's the, that's the focus here. So uh, this past year, there's a, a big group that got together in Delaware, all the scientists that are focused on SCN2A, all the clinicians involved in focusing on SCN2A, and all the uh, family members uh, that have been impacted, have been identified with an SCN2A uh, event. Not all the family members, but a, a good portion of them. All get together to say, how do we all work together? 
uh, scientists, clinicians, and families to come up with uh, what our most appropriate treatment approaches are. Mm -hmm. So what is exciting particularly about SCN2A is there are, there are some medications that are, already, um, that are already out there that may provide some uh, utility for individuals who have a disruption to SCN2A. So that, it's still early days, and this is a lot of animal model work happening right now. There are some early trials with clinicians trying this out for individuals, again, who have a particular SCN2A event. Uh, and what the early work is suggesting that, that through this uh, medication that's already approved that we're adapting now to utilize here, uh, that we're actually seeing changes in that social engagement for kids who have autism, even who are uh, older uh, uh, teenagers and, and young adults. So it's exciting and it's promising. It's still very new, but mm -hmm. what we can anticipate, so that's what we saw this past year, what we can anticipate the next year is even more work in this. There's going to be a, uh, a group gathering in uh, New York City in April to really dive deep and start bringing, again, families together in a way that's really meaningful so that we can actually start to uh, begin to try to pilot these, uh, these early trials. So we're going, to see, we're going to see a lot more of this in the next couple of years, but I wanted to give you a little insight into kind of where we're going. SCN2A is kind of the front runner in this notion of how do we understand the cause for a given person's uh, autism and how we can uh, assign a particular treatment to it. So I think uh, we're on the way. All right. Exciting. Great. Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, back, back to the community. <laughs> right. Thanks, Jim. Okay. <laughs> so uh, here in Washington State, there has been an ongoing lawsuit called, uh, related to what's called the McCleary decision. Uh, so anyone who's outside of Washington, if you might just move forward one, Dave. Um, you know, there's a quick little timeline here to explain really what this, what happened. And the, the, the point of, of McCleary, way back in 2007, a lawsuit was filed that basically said that our state was not providing a basic education to all students mm -hmm. here in the state. It was not funding education adequately. So uh, in 2010, a decision was made in favor of the plaintiffs. Um, and beginning in 2012, our Washington State Supreme Court uh, came down with a ruling, rule, found that Washington State was in contempt of uh, this ruling. So, um, so that's been sort of on, we're going to be talking about it, we've been talking about it, this has to happen every year, and really nothing's happened until last year. So in 2017, finally, the legislature got together uh, and passed a budget of $7.3 million uh, over the next four years, and Governor Inslee signed this. Um, and that was, the, 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 everyone was like, oh, well, we're done. You know, that, that has satisfied McCleary, and now we have uh, funded public education. So, but not so fast, mm -hmm. uh, is what uh, the state Supreme Court said. And there have been a lot of educational advocates. So let's talk a little bit about what it did do, yeah, okay? Great. So um, the budget did in increase teacher salaries. Mm -hmm. Uh, it provided money for training for teachers and uh, paraeducators para and other school staff. Um, and, uh, and also, uh, there were funds that were allocated specifically to uh, districts that had higher poverty, po poverty levels, okay? So, but there was some concerns about the, the budget and some educational advocates have expressed concerns about the formulas that have, that have, that have been developed to um, allocate funds to some of these uh, districts. And there really was no mention of special education with the exception of um, this uh, percentage cap, this, uh, this funding cap per district, which if you haven't heard about, in, in our state, uh, there is this very arbitrary percentage and it went from 127 to 13.5% of a district can have uh, fun can, can receive funding for IEPs and special education. Okay, so of course there are more you know there there are more uh, students who than the 13.5% in some districts. In fact, there's a, a many districts in our state who exceed that 13.5 uh, kind of bizarre cap. Um, so. The problem with this is it really puts districts into a, a kind of tight situation, right? Where they have to say, all right, well, how are we going to, are we going to provide more funds beyond this 13.5? And we're, I mean, more services be beyond this 13.5 when we know we're not going to get the money for it. Um, and uh, so that really kind of, or do we decrease services for kids who really need it? So 
Um, it really does put, put uh, the schools into uh, a challenge. Um, the latest news was this past fall, the Supreme Court uh, made a ruling that said, all right, well, you guys have a year to figure it out. The legislature wanted until to, this to begin September 2019, uh, but the Supreme Court said, no, you guys, it has to start September 1, 2018. So we'll see exactly you know, how this pans out over the year, and certainly we'll be uh, paying close attention to it uh, as it as it pans out. Indeed, following that on our blogcast, uh, we will definitely be uh, keeping everyone focused on what's happening with McCleary. All right, great, Sounds awesome. Great. Um, so uh, we're going to jump back to science for a second, <laughs> and uh, we're going to talk a little about biomarkers. Uh, currently, there are no well-established biomarkers for autism. And what are we talking about when I say biomarkers? Mm -hmm. Well. Um, Thinking about when we intervene with any given, um, you know, with a disease or a, a disorder or a challenge, um, you want to be able to monitor when you're intervening, is, is, are things changing? Are we getting better? Are we getting worse? Are right. we, are, is what we're doing, is our intervention helping? So think about like a biological marker for uh, a heart disease. You might use uh, a blood pressure cuff and check your blood pressure and you can check your blood pressure and then you can intervene, and give a medication and then you can uh, a week later go check your blood pressure again and oh, is this getting better or getting worse? Are we making a change? If it's not getting better, let's try something different. Well, we don't have anything even remotely like that for autism right mm -hmm. now. So there's actually been, uh, in the past couple years, a lot of funds invested from NIH to actually answer this question because how can we actually evaluate and develop any good effective treatments if we actually can't determine, well, this treatment is working or not. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, funds invested in identifying some of these biological markers, and some different types of techniques and technologies have, have emerged as potentials. Uh, we're actually very fortunate to have one of uh, uh, scientists here in town who does a lot of work around biological markers for autism, and so we were going to bring her down to the fern and ask her a little bit about uh, some of the biological markers right. and some of her work in that area. Better so head over to the fern. Better head over to the fern. Uh, Dr. Kaylin Hudak, please join us at the fern. <laughs> oh, yes, yeah, just to jump in. Thank you, thank you. Oh, you're talking about Caitlin, sorry. <laughs> Oops. Um, great. Well, uh, Caitlin, uh, thank you for being here. Yes, you know, I am a, uh, I'm a long time follower, mm. first time guest. So uh, thank you very yes. much for, great. for having me. Happy to have you here. Um, so, uh, I know this past year you did um, uh, a lot of work around a, a particular type of biological marker for autism. Um, you have a, some work that's in progress. I was hoping you just tell us a little about kind of the studies you're doing, or maybe this particular study you focused on last year. Uh, tell us a little about you know, what are you doing with biological markers in autism? Well, that was a great introduction to kind of why we're, where, where the money is coming from and, and where these initiatives are. So, um, and what I just want to point out while the slide's up, um, so these are some of the, the children that participated in our study to kind of give you a sense of what it's like to come in and participate um, specifically in um, this EEG kind of paradigm, which I'll describe next. Um, but hopefully what you can see, even though their faces aren't maybe the happiest um, <laughs> in these pictures specifically, um, we actually do have some kids request to do more brain studies. So it really actually is a really fun kind of interactive way for, for kids to, to be involved and um, it's great information for us. So. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about what it is to do electrophysiology or electroencephalography, or you might hear event-related potential. So just kind of briefly to help us all understand what it is that we're measuring. So we have our kids wear these funny little hats and we soak them with water. So they're a little bit weird and, and uncomfortable, but we have these great kind of procedures um, that parents are doing at home to help their kids understand exactly what to expect when they come in. Um, there's training videos online that you can even watch if you're curious about what that looks like. And so basically we put this net on in just a couple of minutes and then right away we can start recording uh, brain activity. Mm -hmm. So we're actually measuring how the brain um, is sending out different electric signals that fluctuate. So kind of what these little wavy lines are are actual brain waves. And, and you said electric, sorry, electric signals. Is this electric like dangerous electricity? You no. Mean, no. Okay. You're, you, both of us are exuding tons of electric signals okay. in our hands and in our brain. So we're just trying to capture the electric signals that your brain is just naturally emitting. Um, so we record at the scalp, um, but it's, it's completely safe and, and painless. Okay. Um, so what we do is while we're recording these signals, we, we kind of send it an event of some sort. Um, so in this study, I'll talk a little bit about sounds that we play for the, the children to listen to. And then at that point in time, we're able to kind of isolate exactly what's happening um, with that sound. I think you can play. Yes, so when you kind of look specifically at that, just that second, the second that happens right after you hear a noise or see a face, 
we get what we call an event-related potential or an ERP. And so this is, you, you kind of look like little peaks and valleys, um, and we're really just kind of recording that fluctuation over time, but each of those peaks and valleys tell us a little bit something different about how the brain is processing that information. Okay, great. So um, we did a study where we, as I mentioned, we kind of, we played different kinds of noise, and we were really interested in how kids are tuning into something that's new. So when you're listening to something that's repeated over and over and over again, but then you hear something a little different, mm -hmm. how does your brain pick up on that mm -hmm. new piece of information? Great. And what we found is that our children with autism, and we have over 100 kids in this study, it, mm -hmm. it was fantastic, they're showing this, this bigger response. So um, children with autism are kind of overly or, or had this heightened response to new information in, in the world. So you can imagine how that might kind of be just on an everyday basis. If, if noises are kind of causing this heightened response, it could be potentially quite overwhelming for, for mm. children. Interesting. So the other little piece that we did with this study is we actually looked at how these responses change over time. And so it might be kind of hard to kind of understand what's going on here, but basically you want to see the separation between um, the TD, which is our, our typically developing control children, and you see that it's a smaller response, and you see how it kind of fades more quickly over time, whereas our children with autism, they're kind of, they're overly responsive and they're responding to it for a longer mm, period mm, of time. Okay. So that can be kind of taxing on the brain. So at the brain level, the brain is responding more and, and it's not sort of waning over time, habituating over time, the same type of stimuli or exactly, stimuli. Exactly, at the same okay. rate. And okay. it eventually does. So you see at the end, they kind of look about the same. So mm -hmm. eventually the brains kind of are interchangeable in, in some way, but um, that early period is really kind of what, what we're seeing in, in this population. Okay. And then the other thing that I just wanted to point out is that when we have children that have known auditory sensitivities, mm -hmm. so the parents are reporting that they, they have a lot more issues when there are loud noises or surprising noises, we actually see a different pattern in the brain. So mm -hmm. we know this is really mapping on not only to kind of how um, the brain in general is processing information, but it's really specific to specific kids and kind of what problems they might actually gotcha. be experiencing. Gotcha. Marvelous. So so this is all cool. So we have a nice connection there. How does that, uh, I, I guess, what is, the, what is the real world implications of the science? Like what, is, what does that mean for, for families? So what we're kind of working on now and kind of what the next steps are just to try to figure out how all of these different kinds of pieces of biological information, these different biomarkers, mm -hmm. all come together to kind of inform how a person is experiencing the world mm -hmm. and how, how those specific challenges um, are how these kids are kind of dealing with that kind of okay. this, this information. And so we're really starting to narrow in on a lot of different pieces. And so this study was looking at specifically just kind of general auditory processing. But we're learning a lot more too about how they process basic social information, language, and just how the brain is organized generally. And so what our, our kind of, the problem is that it's a really complex problem. Um, and so trying to figure out how we integrate all of these different pieces of information um, is what I think we're going to start to see in 2018 is really kind of getting some answers by integrating across different ways of measuring um, information from these children. Gotcha. So the idea would be someone comes in, they're going to participate in a clinical trial. We, we gather a lot of information using different types of techniques, EEG as you mentioned, maybe some imaging, maybe an eye tracking task. We integrate that uh, and then we intervene. Uh, and we can look at change in those particular markers over time and say, ah, oh, great, this intervention is working, or it's not, we gotta try something different, is that? Okay? And the one other thing I would kind of say to that, except that it just jogged my mind, mm. is that we're actually, this is not just us uh, here at Washington, there's mm. people, um, hopefully maybe tuned in on our live stream across the nation and actually across the world who are actually kind of doing the same thing. So there's a lot of great work being done by scientists to make sure that all of our methods are, are things that we can kind of collapse across so we can work with people in London mm. and, and, and in France and people um, over in Connecticut and down in California, and we're kind of collecting all that information together, which is really giving us a, a great uh, kind of capacity for understanding what's going on. Nice, excellent, cool. Everyone working together. Super cool. We're all, yeah. we're all friends, Lots and uh, <laughs> we're going to solve some stuff. That's great. Well, thank you very much for your time, Eric. Thank you, Dr. So Hudak. Much. Great. All right, back to you, Jim. Right, we talk about education. We talk about ABA. We, we think about uh, kids, but you know, children, right? Yes. They grow up to be adults. They do. It's right? true. That's what I've heard. And uh, so we wanted to, you know, we, we have we wanted to focus a little bit on some of the the issues surrounding providing support for adults, 
And we have yet another amazing guest mm. who is going to join us tonight. Dr. Gary Stobie is a neurologist mm -hmm. at uh, the, the University of Washington Adult Autism Clinic. He is, uh, he's also, I believe, a regular on the blogcast, if I'm not mistaken. He has had quite a, a few expert opinions. <laughs> <laughs> so, thanks, Gary. Thanks for Coming me. on in. Good to see you. All right. Here, just grab one of those. Yeah. So, yeah, just give us a little update on some of the, the situation uh, with providing support for adults in our community. Well, great, yeah, so, so thanks for everybody for coming and thank you guys uh, for, for doing this. Uh, so I always look forward to this uh, event and, and um, you know, we, we, I've done this before with you guys asking like, so what's, you know, what's new, what, what's going on and exciting for uh, adults with autism? And um, I'm a optimist by nature and I was, I was very tempted to put up some of the projects and things that we're doing here here locally, but I really wanted to address this more from a kind of a national uh, standpoint. And unfortunately, from a national standpoint, uh, it's hard to be an optimist um, for when, you, when you're talking about uh, people impacted by autism. Um, so I think we'll, we can go to this, this uh, first slide and, and uh, kind of hit some of these points. And some of these are, are kind of hitting again on uh, what Katrina had said earlier. Uh, this first this first point uh, though is is uh, related to Washington State, um, the uh, Division of Vocational Rehabilitation or or DVR. Uh, so this is another uh, branch uh, that provides services for people with uh, disabilities. So for instance, let's say you're on you you work at a job and and you get a back injury and you cannot return to that job, DVR can help help you in retraining for a new job. Uh, DVR has also provided services for uh, people with autism to help them find find a job. Um, autism people with autism have struggled in the workplace. Their uh, ability to uh, communicate and socialize has impacted their ability to both uh, obtain uh, jobs and maintain jobs. So the unemployment rate and underemployment rate in autism. Has, is really bad. It's a dismal numbers, and this is this affects both individuals that are more severely impacted by autism as well as uh, individuals that are higher functioning with with autism, and and uh, it's a real problem. And in autism, compared to other developmental disabilities, um, have greater difficulties with with employment. So um, unfortunately, uh, what has happened as of November first uh, is. DVR basically ran out of money, and so they're no longer able to support everyone that qualifies for services with DVR. So as of November 1st uh, in Washington State, uh, DVR has made a decision that they are going to only take new applications uh, for people that are more severely impacted. Uh, and this is not specific to autism. This is across the board with all types of disabilities. But for autism, it means that if you're going to DVR to have them help you get employment, you have to be more severely impacted. You have to qualify for DDA. So that people, this is again what Katrina mentioned, uh, people that have IQs of uh, less than 85 uh, and that have adaptive skills that are, uh, that are also significantly impacted. So if you're an individual that has, uh, let's say you're uh, trying to, you trying to get through college but but you're having troubles and you want to get a you want to get work you want to get help for DVR right now you're going to be going on a wait list uh, we do not know how long this is going to stay in this condition uh, DVR in Washington State has been in this situation in the past and it lasted for a number of years so uh, this is unfortunate news so that's my first downer. Mm -hmm. um, my second, yeah, thank you're welcome. Um, the, second, the second downer is really what uh, Katrina talked about before, which is about the, the loss of behavioral, positive behavioral support services through the waiver program with DDA. So, this, so now this affects individuals that, so the DVR affects people that don't qualify for DDA. This affects people that do qualify for DDA and how it affects adults, uh, you know, the, the ruling came down from the feds basically saying that, well, you shouldn't get your ABA or behavioral support through, through DDA. You can get it through your medical insurance because, remember, you guys had a class action lawsuit and now ABA is covered on your medical insurance. Ah, but if you look at the, the ruling uh, in that class action lawsuit, it was only up to age 21. 
So if, you, if your primary insurance is Medicaid and you're over age 21, you can't go through Medicaid to get behavioral services. But wait a minute, now you can't get it through DDA either. So this is a, this is a big problem. We're in the midst of this. I, uh, we're not sure exactly how this is going to turn out. Uh, individuals that, adults that are receiving uh, behavioral supports through DDA, DDA has been doing a lot of good work trying to keep those supports in place uh, while we try to approach insurances to, to get these services. So um, right now it's a, it's a real crisis for a lot of, a lot of families, unfortunately. Um, Downer, that was downer number two. So, Gary, um, you know, what are, are there things that, that families can do? You know, I mean, what, what is it something that, that we as the autism community might be able to communicate or advocate for to express, you know, that we don't want this to happen and, you know, we're upset about it? Right. I, I think that's a great qu question. I mean, th I think we all have a responsibility to, to um, voice these concerns. I think the biggest thing is with families, and I think uh, – we don't want people to just say, oh, I guess I can't do this. Yep. We, really, we really need to speak out. And we need to accumulate these. And I think the uh, Washington Autism Alliance and Advocacy is a great place. Uh, you know, they want to hear your voice so that they can capture these. We, we believe for adults that in the not too distant future, there can be a similar class action lawsuit that will lead to the decision that, that behavioral therapy is also medically indicated for adults, it's not like all of a sudden it's no longer medically indicated. Uh, you know, so so I think that we have we have to hear those voices. We have to collect those cases. You know, for ultimately for for legislative events or judicial events mm -hmm. to occur that will change this. So, um, my third point is uh, was mentioned by Katrina uh, earlier also, um, which is the housing crisis. So uh, if you're a fam, let's say you're an a individual with autism and you need support for living and you've been relying on your parents, your parents are getting older, um, you want to become more independent. And uh, so the state through, again, through DDA typically will fund and support your ability to live more independently. Um, but, and there are a lot of people that want this and there's just a, terrible shortage and so we have families literally that have approached you know DDA and said yes I'm ready for my my uh, adult son or daughter to uh, move out of the house and and uh, ha but continue to have support uh, what do I do and right now there's just a real shortage and, and um, there's a number of factors that go into this uh, again I think this is a this is where we have to continue to voice our concern mm -hmm. um, I'm a big believer that we should be more proactive than reactive. Um, I think right now we are in a situation where, where we're reactive. We don't have enough fuel in the system to be proactive. So we're always just putting out fires. Um, I think if we can get, uh, you know, I think funding into this area is actually an investment. It's not a cost. I think mm -hmm. if you invest in these areas, I think ultimately you prevent the fires from starting. Yep. And, and I think that we can, we can ultimately save money um, in this situation. And housing is a, is a big issue because lack of adequate housing, what happens? It then affects mental health, physical health. Uh, it has these very broad reaching effects, not just to the individual, but to everyone else around that individual as well. Yep. Um, so, you know, just to, to plug one of our uh, later lectures this year, we are going to be having a panel uh, to discuss housing uh, issues with adults. I think it's in uh, July. Excellent. So yes, I think in the, the in summer our Autism 200, we usually will have a couple that will focus on adults, and, and I think we that will be, a, I'll be interested to attend that. Yes, that will be a good one. Yeah. So, um, okay, so are there any smiley faces? <laughs> um, we can go to the next next slide. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to hit this bo bottom one, which is the, the um, uh, ABLE Act, which is Achieving a Better Life Act. This is a uh, this is a mechanism that is a, uh, was a, a federal, federally funded, which uh, allows for individuals uh, with uh, developmental disabilities to actually save money uh, without losing uh, their services that are state and federal. So in the past, it was challenging because if you started to, let's say you're the parent and your child 
you, you're saying, I want to put money to save for them for their house when they're later, when I'm gone. Well, all of a sudden, you, could, you couldn't do that because if they built up this, this fund, then they would lose their services because they say, oh, look, they have money in a fund. They can't, shouldn't deserve these services anymore. So the ABLE Act allows uh, parents and families to invest and put money into an account that can later be uh, tapped into for, for continuing services and support for their adult um, loved one. So that was great. Then, so that's in place. And we have a link here uh, that will get you to um, necessary information. You can do this online. You're able to kind of work through and open up an ABLE account. Uh, you don't need a legal support you know, to do this. You can do this on, on your own. So, uh, so that's good news. Um, the top bullet point, I think, is uh, uh, a nice one uh, from the standpoint of, of self-advocacy. And, and really just awareness. I think there is an increasing awareness of, of the needs for people uh, with, uh, that are impacted by autism. And uh, I think these are voices that are coming from individuals that identify as autistic, and I think, and their families and loved ones. Uh, you know, I think we're seeing examples of this in, uh, in the media. I think we're seeing examples of it in entertainment. You know, there are a number of shows now on TV that have characters that are, uh, that self-identify as autistic. And I think this is great because I think just it's, it's, it's more awareness. Um, I think that it does, there are some interesting things that come about with regards to uh, self-advocacy uh, that, because I, I think you guys know this as much as anybody, that people are so, you know, we say autism, but there are so many differences. And so we run it. Do we do run into problems about about um, you know describing one person and then and then oh well, that that person's got this great savant skill uh, that's wonderful autism is so cool um, you know but that's not that's only a part of the story right and so we do we do run into those issues but I think in general I think it's a good thing that there that there is this kind of more self awareness and especially the movement by individuals that. Uh, are impacted themselves. I think this has affected our field uh, in in medicine and in, in research. I think in research studies now, uh, it is now the accepted norm to have an individual that is autistic, that self-identifies as autistic, to be an advisor to a research study. Um, I think that we're we're late to the game on this. I, I think Seattle Children's is a perfect example. We're Seattle Children's is so used to working with parents. You know, we're not. We're not used to working with self-advocates and, and adults that, that have the conditions. And so, so we've got a lot of work to do on this, um, but it's exciting. It's exciting to have these uh, kind of discussions. So, um, and I think on, on that note, um, what I'd like to do is actually is invite our next guest uh, to come up, right. who is one of our favorite self-advocates, uh, <laughs> Zach Sadiq, if you would come on up and, uh, We'll introduce yourself, and, and uh, actually, why don't you get out of here, and I'll take over your, your seat, or Zach will sit over there, and I'll, and I'll stay here. Okay, and I think we've got a, a fern mic for you. Can you all hear me? Yeah, cool. There we awesome. go. Well, Zach, thanks for, thanks for coming, yeah. and uh, um, this is a, a topic that I know is on on your mind a lot yeah. and uh, we've known each other you and I have known each other for a while but why don't you what, just in, years, yeah. introduce while, yourself yeah. and maybe do a little bit of background and then and then you can you can dive more into some of these issues affecting uh, sure. adults with autism yeah so um, like y'all heard my name is Zach Sadiq I I'm on the autism spectrum I was diagnosed when I was about 11 um, and you know it's something that's definitely flavored like all of my life. Like I can't really separate it from, um, oh, I thought, okay, you're okay, <laughs> Kane, wasn't sure. You know, it's not really Sorry. something that I can separate from anything I do or anything from my identity. Um, and, you know, things are, you know, definitely a little difficult out there for some of us. And I'm, I uh, run an organization called the Square Pigs, which is um, Seattle's and Western Washington's um, autism meetup group. We have about 120 people attend eight, our eight groups each month, and it's um, always good to have a sense of community in a world where you know most people out there 
aren't really like us and don't often understand, um, you know, how we think, how we feel, and just what, you know, what we really want out of life. Um, I'm also a social work student over at the University of Washington. I'm in my second year of the master's program, so I'm gonna bring in a little um, social work here and um, talk a little about how is disability, um, which, you know, autism is connected to disability, how is it talked about within society? What are the different models of disability? And then how does that impact the services we receive? And then how does that um, impact, you know, the outcomes of those of us who are autistic? So, you know, the first and often um, most heard of model of disability is the medical model, which is where disability is basically seen as something like a disease, like cancer, you know. You have these symptoms that are different than other, you know, other people who don't have like, you know, this disability. So in order to um, work with it, you receive these treatments with the intention of curing it. Um, you know, it wasn't even a couple years ago when the most common discourse around <coughs> autism was talking about curing it, kind of like cancer or epilepsy or something like that. And that's, you know, just living with that reality where autism is seen as a disease is something that can be really um, difficult for those of us who are on the spectrum. Um, and so, you know, oftentimes there's a lot of tension related to discourse um, coming from autistics towards, you know, the common forms of discourse. And that's changed a little um, the past couple of years. Um, second one that's often discussed around disability is the rehabilitative model, which is basically where it's like, you have an injury, and so, okay, here's what you're gonna do. You're gonna do these exercises, and you're gonna get better. Um, and, you know, that's something that's commonly seen in, you know, like the Department of Vocational Rehabilitation. It has the word rehabilitation in it, and the idea is that there's these underdeveloped skills that you need to develop in order to fit and participate in society. Um, and then the third model um, that a lot of disability activists used is the social model of disability, which is where it's not, um, like for me, like being autistic isn't what's giving me, you know, making things hard. It's the fact that most people in society aren't autistic. And so as a result, we run into these really difficult situations where most people don't really understand us. Um, an example I could give is like having, you know, glasses, like, most people wouldn't consider having glasses a disability because we have these like modifications we can use to fit the environment we exist within that you know allows us to do whatever we need. Um, and so the ideal, <coughs> the ideal eventually is to move towards more of a social model of working with autism. Um, so related to that, there's often debates over like how should knowledge be prioritized when you're talking about autism? Should it be what you read in research studies? Should it be what you see in the news or um, hear from parents or people, you know, those of us who are autistics themselves? So it's really, um, there's a lot of discussion over like the lived experience versus sort of like the more research science focus and like, well, what do we really do around all of that? Um, and so moving to some like spe specific examples, um, you know, most of you have probably heard that, you know, there is an 80% unemployment rate, you know, for those of us who are on the spectrum. And it's something that's, you know, definitely impacted my life. It's something that's impacted almost all of our lives. Like most of us have to put in so much more energy in just trying to, you know, survive and be employed, and it's it's pretty tricky. So let's, um, for example, let's look at a model um, that uh, the Department of Vocational Rehabilitation is using right now. And you know, there's a lot of great work they do. Um, they are very focused on finding us jobs, but as a result, they don't really look at like how do we keep jobs for most of of us. Like, you know. If we can last six months in a job, then it means we'll be able to hold it for a long period of time. Like most of us have been, fi if we get fired, and most of us have, it's within a couple of months. Um, and so as a result, the current DVR model ends services at 90 days versus the 180 days where, um, you know, where we really need the sp support up until. And, 
you know, I think a lot of it comes down to the fact that DVR is extremely underfunded in Washington State, and that's absolutely something that needs to change um, to benefit everyone on the spectrum and everyone really with a disability. But then there's other examples as well. Um, does anyone know what the number 16 refers to when discussing autism? Anyone? Hmm. So the average life expectancy of autistics is 16 years less than the general populations. Um, and I'll go a little more into that, but there is a lot of reasons why. Um, you know, for autistics with epilepsy, um, the life expectancy is 30 years less. Um, and for though for um, autistic women with intellectual disabilities, I think the life expectancy is 26 years less. And there's just a lot of different factors going into that. Um, there actually hasn't been very much research looking into all of this. Um, the one study I'm aware of that actually looks at a large um, sample size of autistics um, sampled 209, um, and they had a list of about, I think it was around 100 barriers to treatment. Um, and then they just had the participants, you know, check off like which of these impact you and then which of these like really, really, really impact you. Um, and so 56 barriers that would like completely prevent treatment from happening were endorsed by 5% of the participants as, you know, like stopping, you know, stopping any medical treatment or med mental health treatment. And then 23 barriers were endorsed by 20% of the sample. So that's a really huge amount. Um, and so, you know, the top five um, barriers were fear and anxiety, um, a difference in being able to process like sensory information, maybe, you know, processing verbal memory at like a l different rate than like, you know, the rate the doctor is going, because you know how doctors are, right? They, love, they, they talk pretty <laughs> fast, yeah. Um, you know, and then thinking about like the unemployment rate, like 12% of the um, sample size were uninsured. Um, and that actually matches up with the other sample they had of non-disabled individuals. But for individuals with another disability, it was, they only had a 2% um, uninsured rate. So it's interesting to wonder like what's going on with there. And the biggest one was actually difficulty communicating with providers. Um, so thinking about like, what do we do about that? Do we provide therapies or treatments in like, you know, quote unquote, improving our social skills? Or do we really look at how can we train providers and like healthcare workers on a systemic level to really be able to understand how to work with us? Like it would be, I mean, from my perspective, it would be so much easier that way. And a couple months ago, actually, I was asked to go um, advocate for um, a self-identified autistic who was receiving services at one of the local inpatient psychiatric units for um, suicidal ideations he was experiencing. He you know, had a lot of depression related to just how hard it is out there. Um, and you know, the doctors and medical providers didn't really know what they were, um, how to really interact with autistics. They were assuming he had schizophrenia, um, didn't really look at, do a full comprehensive assessment. They didn't look at like why you know, why is this, why did all of this start in childhood instead of like adulthood? And then um, what really got me is that they wanted to pr prescribe him an anti-psychotic um, medication to quote, promote eye contact and sociability. That was their, that was their approach. They didn't really want to, um, you know, look at like how the way they were interacting with him was contributing to these poor health outcomes. And that's just one example I know out of least a couple dozen. Um, so as a result um, of all of these inaccessibilities in healthcare and mental health care, our suicide rate is nine times higher than the general population. Um, and unfortunately that hasn't changed and I don't really see that changing anytime soon until you know, we really get accepted. Um, and yeah, it's something that impacts all of us. Mm -hmm. um, so I also, we're looking at, I was looking at other statistics related to our experience. A lot of these came from 2008, and I think these are extremely low. Mm -hmm. Like looking at the domestic violence rate um, amongst you know, those of us who are on the spectrum, I would guess that's at least 50%, if not higher. Mm -hmm. um, most of us have been in abusive relationships before. 
um, sexual assault, I know that at least 75% of individuals with intellectual disabilities have been sexual, sexually assaulted in their lifetimes. Um, and it's extremely underreported. Um, and the 35% of autistics who have been um, you know, victims of a crime, that's only what's been reported. That number is so much higher. And we really need to look at what's actually happening. Um, one other statistic is that only 1% of research funding within the United States looks at um, the experience of autistics in adulthood. Mm -hmm. That needs to change. Because, you know, our lives are literally at stake on this. Um, so moving away, um, the takeaway should be that autistics are absolutely needed in every level where there are decisions being made about us. Um, you know, whether it be in, like, you know, mental health clinics that are treating us or, like, you know, with regards to, like, IEPs or even, like, in the governmental policies that are... Um, you know, being made in that impact our lives. Like right now, there's just no, really no representation and that absolutely um, needs to change. Like we are extremely unemployed and I'm sure there could be plenty of jobs available in like, you know, clini clinics or organizations that serve us. And, you know, there's definitely a lot of work that needs to be done in looking at the different models of disability and how those are, um, laid out in the treatment and actually um, there's going to be a series of dialogues between some of the local autistic advocates, parent advocates and professionals and really looking at how do we move forward, like how do we really work together in an inclusive and equitable way um, and we're actually going to talk about that in November um, at the Autism 200. So. Um, that's about all the time I have. Um, I could probably talk on this for hours, so I don't want to, you know, <laughs> talk your ears off. And there's a lot of other wonderful people who are going to say other things. So thanks, yeah. thanks, Zach. That was that was great. I mean, I think it it really highlights. Uh, you know, we spend so much time trying to uh, change behavior, and it would be nice if we changed our behavior. Um, and and there's a lot of room for improvement. And thanks again. Yeah. You know, really appreciate your time. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Um, so, you know, those two guys are working hard <laughs> for, you know, making, making the world a better place. So we really appreciate them being here. And, you know, right now, I mean, Dr. Stoby mentioned something about uh, the medical institution needing mm -hmm. to change. And, and I just wanted to really quickly respond to some feedback we received. Uh, you know, there, I know there's a lot of people who are watching uh, from home or from a school or for you know somewhere outside of, of this auditorium and in order to do that you had to, to go through our sign up mm -hmm. form right. um, and we got I just wanted to read two of the feedbacks a couple of the feedbacks that we received from uh, autis autistic adults mm -hmm. I'm offended that you cannot register for the live stream as autistic mm -hmm. and the lack of an option for I am autistic concerned me as well I was interested in the session titled we're all in this together which is going to be led by by Zach as the tensions between autistic adults and autis autism parents are a matter of some concern to me, and there are few, if any, mm -hmm. faces that are welcoming to both, the sign up from to the sign up form doesn't inspire mm -hmm. confidence, to put it mildly. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to thank uh, both of those people for providing us with that feedback, and you know I we aspire to be inclusive. We asp aspire to include uh, multiple perspectives mm -hmm. when uh, you know within the autism community. And you know we have a lot to learn, mm -hmm. so uh, so some changes will be made to that form. So please come back, and uh, what were you right? That sounds great. That sounds great. Um, well, and maybe that's maybe a plug for why I want to talk about science a little bit more because we're always trying to yeah. figure things out, do things a little better, maybe. Um, and uh, so we've chatted a little bit about what science has said about uh, genetics. We've talked a little about what science is saying about what's going on in the brain a little bit. Um, I'd like to spend a little time talking about behavior. And there was a, a, a paper that was actually called out by the Autism Science Foundation in their year, rev year in review of 2017 uh, that was uh, published by a scientist from here at uh, in University of Washington. I thought it'd be great to let's, let's bring that scientist on in okay. to meet at the Fern and talk about that study. Awesome. Let's do it. I love we it. could have Dr. Ann Arnett join us here. You could meet me at the Fern, please. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Oh, not me. Sorry. Oops. <laughs> great. Okay, yeah. <laughs> yes, there we go. Um, thank you, 
and for joining us this evening. I'm glad to be here. Thanks. Excellent. Um, so we have this paper that you published that came out earlier this year. Uh, the Autism Science Foundation called it out in their year in review. Just tell us a little about what happened to the study, and maybe maybe that might lead to why did the Autism Science Foundation call this out? Yeah, sure. I'd, I'd be glad to. Um, so as a little bit of background, there are two things that we know about autism that are really important um, for understanding this study. The first being that there is there are a proportion of individuals with autism spectrum disorder who have um, a gene event like you were talking about mm -hmm. earlier, some sort of change or mutation to the gene that changes the way it functions. Mm -hmm. Um, and the gene is usually related to brain development. Uh, the other piece of information that we know is that a large proportion of individuals with autism also have symptoms of inattention, hyperactivity, impulsivity, the sorts of symptoms that we see in attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And this is a large proportion. It's like 20 to 50 percent is the estimate. So up to half of all individuals with autism have uh, symptoms of inattention. Um, so this study aimed to kind of bring those two pieces of knowledge together and ask the question of, are there gene events that also account for some of this uh, comorbidity of inattention or symptoms of inattention in individuals with autism? So the short answer to that is yes. <laughs> Um, so we saw a whole bunch of individuals and families who came in who we know have genetic events related to autism. And do we have a slide? Yeah, there it is. Yeah, wow. in color. Yeah. Um, oh, but the legend got cut off. I apologize. That was probably my fault. Um, and basically we, got, we saw a whole bunch of genes. There were actually about, or nearly 30 of them, about 27. And as it turns out, close to half of those genes that we saw, or particular genes that were impacted, were associated with elevated levels of inattention, okay. um, which means that uh, we could, so anybody with an event on one of those genes was at higher risk for inattentive symptoms, even if they didn't t technically cross the threshold for a diagnosis of comorbid ADHD. Okay. Right. Um, and what's the, the second part about that, like in addition to that, we also saw that these individuals who had one of those high risk genes also had impairment on measures of what we call cognitive uh, or executive cognition, so executive functioning, things like processing speed, how quickly can you make sense of information and do something with it, inhibition, how quickly can you stop yourself from doing something that your brain is already sort of programmed to do, um, cognitive flexibility, how quickly can you, or how easily can you switch between two rules, like matching on color and then matching by shape, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and so people with these high-risk genes are actually at higher risk for having difficulties on tasks like that, mm -hmm. which is really interesting because individuals with ADHD, whether or not they have autism symptoms, also have difficulty on tasks like that. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. So, so really, it uh, sounds like sort of looking at the, the connections uh, between ADHD and autism uh, closely and then thinking about that from, a, a, I guess, sort of the biology, the etiology of these two different behaviorally defined disorders, so to speak. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. So, so that's cool from a science perspective. Uh, what what does that mean? Like, what does that mean for 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 the community? Yeah, I'm yeah. so glad you asked. Rick. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the reason I think this is important for families is that as we get closer to sort of characterizing these gene events that we know are associated with autism, it's important to also think about all the other symptoms that come along with autism, particularly with some of these specific genes. Because mm. um, we know that individuals with autism and also inattentive symptoms and hyperactivity and impulsivity, some of the symptoms or behaviors that are hardest for families to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis mm -hmm. are those difficulties with inhibition, mm -hmm. difficulties with attending. Um, that gets in the way of schoolwork. It gets in the way of developing peer relationships. And so these are, um, these are symptoms that are highly prevalent and they're also really impactful and need a, a lot of attention. And so if we can get a better sense of which genes or which um, types of etiologies could create more risk, not only for autism, but also for inattention, mm -hmm symptoms, then we have a better chance of targeting treatment for the, the symptoms that are really impairing as well as um, thinking more about, you know, developmentally what to expect over time from these kids. That's awesome. Well, cool. Well, just sort of hearing that makes me realize that's why Autism Science Foundation called that one out, because that's great. <laughs> um, well, thank you very much for coming in and just chatting with us a little bit about this very cool study. Yeah. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Back to you, Jim. All right, Rafe. So. Um, now we're going to talk about some good news. 
Okay, it was kind of some downer news that you know Dr. Gary Stobie mm. was mentioning. So uh, I want to talk about some good <laughs> stuff. Yeah, that's great. And uh, and it links to what Zach was referring to earlier about um, sort of changing society. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, uh, there's been a lot of efforts this past year to increase inclusion. You mm -hmm. know, and what what do we mean by in inclusion? Uh, it really refers to that welcoming, mm -hmm. uh, pe people feeling welcome in, in their communities. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this past year there has been a task force called the uh, Making Seattle the City of Inclusion. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, this year there's an opportunity. Uh, this summer there's going to be the 2018 uh, National Games for the Special Olympics are going to be held here. So it's an opportunity for Seattle and, and broader Washington State to uh, to demonstrate, mm -hmm. you know, our values in regards to to including people with intellectual, social, behavioral differences. Mm -hmm. So, um, other there have been lots of other. We've we've kind of <coughs> really talked up WA uh, mm -hmm. this evening in the arc of King County, and of course they're involved in in these efforts as well. Mm -hmm. And in June of 2017, mm -hmm. there was a symposium that was held. Uh, at the uh, Microsoft campus mm -hmm. uh, by one of the local nonprofits called uh, the Welcome Inclusion Initiative. Mm -hmm. And uh, what Wynn is aiming to do is to work with local businesses, provide support to local businesses and the places that, that people go mm -hmm. uh, to help them understand people with differences, mm -hmm. people who are socially a little different. Um, so that, that, that they will have the skills. So it really is referring to what, what Gary was uh, talking about mm -hmm. is how do, how, does the, how do we teach the community to be more welcoming and more accepting of people with autism and, yeah. and other differences. So um, you know, there's, there's a lot of information if you go to the, the Welcome Inclusion website. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, last summer we, we had a chance to interview two uh, mm. of the founding members of this. And you know, I don't think we have as enough time to, okay. to sure. watch that, that video, but if you kind of go on to uh, our broadcast, okay. they're all archived on our YouTube page, and you might be able to, to watch that video of, yeah. of those two pretty impressive people. <laughs> pretty impressive, those gentlemen, indeed. So, yeah, <laughs> next. <laughs> I don't even know what to say. Um, okay, gr great. All right. All right. So um, we chatted a little bit about in terms of science, uh, genetics, the brain, a little about behavior. Uh, haven't really said much about what's happened this past year in terms of uh, focus on uh, supports, uh, interventions, and things like that. Uh, what I want to highlight is one big study that uh, came out this past year. Um, it was published uh, about uh, a publication focusing on a very large a randomized controlled trial focusing on improvisational music therapy for kids with ASD. Now, uh, this type of study is important because the vast majority of interventions that are used to support individuals with autism, uh, uh, there's no uh, empirical ex examination of their effectiveness mm -hmm. with the vast majority. Um, Right now, as it stands, we know that the only empirically supported treatment and support for, for individuals with autism are those therapies based on ABA. Uh, uh, but there's been a, there's a lot of other uh, options. And when you look out and you Google autism treatment, poof, you know, five bazillion uh, responses. Uh, but we just have the science that hasn't caught up and explored all of that. So um, what this large multi-site study did was say, well, let's, let's look at improvisational music therapy. Music therapy has been proposed as an intervention uh, to support uh, individuals with autism. There have been a couple smaller studies that had said, oh, this is, uh, uh, this is an effective um, intervention to help improve social communication skills. Now, this was a very well done study. What this study did was they looked at uh, a sample of 350 children with autism, all between the ages of four and six. Uh, they used a very standardized intervention approach. They used uh, a couple different dosage amounts of improvisational music therapy, um, uh, uh, which took place over five months, multiple time points, uh, or multiple uh, sessions per week. Uh, they had a comparison group mm -hmm. where they looked at individuals who were receiving uh, uh, regular contact and with advice um, and support from a um, uh, from a counselor. So the Basically, the same sort of amount of time was being spent in some sort of intervention that was controlled across, 
across uh, different in, er, arms. Uh, everyone that participated in the study was uh, well characterized, well diagnosed. We made sure that we had everyone uh, that met very particular, clear inclusion and exclusion criteria. And I highlight these things because the vast majority of research on interventions uh, uh, that aren't focused on ABA have, have failed to meet all these sort of very basic standards of randomized controlled mm -hmm. trials. Uh, so uh, they then looked at, and the scientists then uh, looked at, what was the outcome? First, they, they uh, did very careful ass uh, assessments of uh, uh, direct observation of social communication abilities, and then had also parent report of social communication abilities, characterized all that information at the very beginning for these 350 kids, did these, uh, randomized their uh, children to different groups, uh, did an intervention um, uh, with sort of varying dosages, and then also had this control group. And then at five months later, they assessed those same sort of characteristics um, in terms of uh, direct observation by a clinician who did not know which treatment the child received, as well as then parent report, so kind of different ways to look at social communication skills. And then they followed up several months after that to sort of see, well, what happens? Well, the, the results are this. There was absolutely zero effect, zero impact of improv improvisational music therapy. So the kids that underwent all of this improvisational musical therapy, they looked exactly the same uh, uh, after that uh, treatment as their comparison group did also looked exactly the same. So a lot of energy, a lot of effort, um, which is important though. We need to have this science to sort of say what is working and what doesn't work because mm -hmm. families spent a lot of money prior to the study, a lot of money and time using this therapy, which could be great also. Don't get me wrong, playing music is awesome and that's totally cool and, and I think what this study suggests is that's totally fine. Um, there were no, there were no um, uh, side effects to, to this treatment, um, but it was not impacting social communication skills. And it was very critical given, uh, it was a good example for how we should be doing this science to understand all the different things that are going on at a proposed treatments for autism. Um, so I, maybe I'll just stop there uh, and say, I'm excited about this type of research. We need to do more of this because we need to be able to answer these questions effectively. Mm -hmm. But we don't often uh, have this sort of research to call back on. So what I like to do and think about is this following thing that I'm going to highlight, which is just a very simple, quick uh, uh, matrix that I want to just talk about for one nanosecond because I realize we're running low on time. So uh, uh, one way for us to think about any interventions for autism would be to think about on two different um, dimensions. One is think about what do we know about the safety of this particular intervention and what do we know about the effectiveness of this intervention. And we just would uh, gather information from our providers, from our, uh, from the scientific literature and say, well, what can we tell us about this? For those uh, interventions that are highly effective and that are very safe, like up here in the upper right hand column, these would be things like uh, 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 treatments, uh, interventions based on applied behavioral analysis. We're going to recommend those. We're going to obviously going to monitor as we go along, but we're going to recommend those. The things that, uh, this good example here from this, this very large study of improvisational music therapy, we looked at the effectiveness is very limited, so effect up there in the top left. The safety is there were no side effects. Uh, playing music is kind of fun. People enjoy that. Um, so that's the kind of thing where we'd say, well, there's no effectiveness, but uh, it's not unsafe, so we're okay with that. We just want to, you know, be be careful and cognizant of uh, what not to expect. Mm -hmm. And we also wouldn't want that to take the place of things that we know are effective. So uh, kind of an important piece. But this is just a quick matrix for us to think about these types of studies when we, are f when we don't have these awesome, big, clear, well-designed, randomized controlled trials. I'm hoping that we see more of this in 2018. I'm not going to say with a lot of confidence that's where the money is going right now from NIH to sort of drive into these um, other types of treatments that are out there, but I think this is the kind of work that needs to be done. I'm going to pause right, right there, Jim. That was one nanosecond. Was Boom. Good. Okay, done. Great. Okay, great. Thank so, you. and you know, I think it's important because there we we do hear so many different uh, things that the people are trying to mm -hmm. do, and mm -hmm. you you know, you hear about all these different therapies, and mm -hmm. there's a new therapy every other other week, mm -hmm. and we need to be able to assess what is the most effective because yeah. we all have limited resources. We do, right? Exactly. We have money. We have insurance, we have time, yep. and uh, we want to make sure that families are getting the uh, accurate information mm -hmm. so that they can use those resources the right way. Yep. Okay, Great. so quickly, uh, you know, there has been, uh, we've always talked about autism in the media, and you know, it has been in, in the media for a long time. I mean, a lot of us grew up on Rain Man, and there have been uh, the Temple Grandin story and, and books, but this past year there were quite a few mm -hmm. more, and I think what, um, what Gary was referring to earlier was um, the fact that we're getting, there's, there's more and more of, of uh, these types of 
uh, shows and musicals and uh, uh, you know that represent across the spectrum. You know, the A word is uh, a child who has more uh, significant difficulties, and the good doctor is a uh, you know a, a, a adult who has uh, a more high functioning mm -hmm. autism on, on the spectrum. So, hopefully, what this is doing is providing more of that awareness, more of that understanding to the broader community, so that. Uh, everybody is beginning, beginning to just say, all right, there's people who are different out there, and they're not any different than anybody else, mm -hmm. all right? So, and our final story tonight is uh, something that didn't happen in 2017, which was the repeal of the Affordable Care Act. Uh, and the Affordable Care Act provides uh, Medicaid uh, funds for Medicaid uh, to all the state, you know, to many, most of the states, and especially to Washington state. And in, wa in Washington, uh, people use their Medicaid benefits to provide, not only cover basic health care needs, but to pay for ABA therapy or to pay for developmental therapy, speech and occupational therapy. Um, so it was good news mm -hmm. that, uh, that that didn't happen this year. However, Looking forward, uh, especially with the new tax plan that was, uh, the, no, the new tax, tax law mm -hmm. that was passed, um, there is bound to be spending cuts. And mm -hmm. I think that's what a lot, of, a lot of people are worried about, is that where are these spending cuts going to be mm -hmm. um, that might go along with the big tax cuts mm -hmm. that, that happen. So uh, we're worried about you know, quote unquote, entitlement programs uh, like Social Security, Medicaid, Medicare, and DDA, things that, that we've talked about mm -hmm. um, today. So uh, 2018 is uh, an election year, mm -hmm. okay? And, um, and really what we, what we want you to, to, to do, and we encourage you to do, is to make your views known and to contact your representative. And, and we, we have a, a list of all the Washington State members of Congress with their phone numbers here. So. Uh, nice and convenient, call them, let them know, you know, this is important to me, this is important to uh, the autism community. Um, and if you uh, are more of an email person, you can contact, it. most of them have a form on mm -hmm. their website that you can fill out, send, in them, send them an email, uh, and they have offices all, mm -hmm. you know, all around the state as well. So yeah. you could even make an appointment and go talk to someone in person. Love that, love that idea. So. Great. Well, yeah. so I think just to sort of draw us to a close, just want to highlight another big advance from 2017, which was that, uh, you know, the, the Jim and Rafe blogcast got picked up uh, by an organization in based in New York City called Spectrum, uh, uh, where they provide uh, science-based news. And so you can actually catch us on the Spectrum uh, website where we have a also another blogcast there. Uh, it's, it comes out every uh, once every two months or so. The Spectrum has also set up our own uh, Facebook program and our Twitter. Twitter? Twitter and, and Twitter. Facebook. Twitter and Facebook. Is it a program? <laughs> I Facebook? don't know what it is. I don't know what they're doing with us. Yeah. But, we, but so. we have those things now, and we're very excited. So feel free to, A, check us out not only with the Autism Blogcast through Seattle Children's, but also through uh, the, autism, the inside scoop from the Autism Anchors at Spectrum, as well as our Facebook page, Autism Anchors. And if you... I guess tweet? you can follow us. You can follow I us. I think that's what the right that's word right. is. Thank you. So you, you can follow followed, our tweets. You can and you can like tweets. us too. So <laughs> that would be great. But um, don't really follow us out here right. today. Um, that would be creepy. That would be creepy. Good point. So on that note, so many people we have to thank for helping us out here tonight. Uh, let's see here on our, uh, yep. on our page here. Um, with that last note, uh, we want to maybe say something about that 200 yeah. schedule. And, and you know, so we, we cover, well, we, offer 200 lectures every mm -hmm. month, and we have an amazing uh, lineup this year. Uh, some, of, some of the people who were here this evening are gonna be uh, speaking, mm -hmm. and uh, so please come out, please tune in, uh, tune in from right. home, mm -hmm. and uh, we look forward to seeing you next month, and we are here uh, to answer some questions, and, and any of our, our experts mm -hmm. that came, uh, if you have questions for them, we've got a couple of minutes, and. Uh, and why don't we start with some, anybody in here, or if, if people, you know, Milani will wave to us if they've got any questions from uh, outside. That's great. Do, we, do you want to stand up? Let's go sit by the fern. Let's go sit, Let's go by sit the on the fern. We're, we're going to sit by the ferns. Among the ferns. Yeah. <laughs> Indeed. And any questions? And we're also okay to not answer any questions. If there's no questions, that's totally fine. I, I think know. it's with you, Caitlin. Caitlin's got a question. 
So I know um, that this year was also, 2017 had a lot of um, emphasis on girls and autism, which you guys mm -hmm. have spoken about. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you could comment on kind of where the field's going and, and what we know about girls with autism for this audience as well. Yeah, great question, great question. So, um, well, so one of the things that's long been known is that autism is diagnosed about three or four times more often in boys than girls. That's that's different from saying autism happens more often. It's diagnosed more often. And there's been a lot of questions about that. The one major question is, is that um, are there real uh, differences in the actual prevalence incidence of, of autism in boys or girls, or is there something that we're missing in terms of our diagnosis, or are we, do we think about autism differently? Because a couple things I'll say is this. There's been a lot of research to suggest that from the molecular side, the genetic side, is that uh, uh, when you look at individuals with autism who have a particular genetic event, and sort of take all the individuals that are studied with autism and then select out those folks for whom we have identified a particular genetic contributor, uh, that, that diagnostic rate drops down to closer to two to one or one to one. Um, and uh, that's a bit of one bit of information. The other bit of information is if you take and look uh, at the number of uh, genetic events that, uh, um, that boys have versus girls have, uh, or other potential risk factors, it, it seems that a girl with autism requires more risk factors, uh, greater genetic burden or greater uh, risk factor burden to end up with autism. So there's something protective about females mm -hmm. um, would be what uh, the, the molecular side would say. I think my wife would say that, duh, because you're like <laughs> missing part of your DNA, Rafe. That's what she would say to me. But anyway, that's okay, maybe another story for another time. Um, so, uh, so that's, I think, where the field is going is trying to understand this, is what is really, I think it's a nice pause, but what is protective um, about being a female? How, how does that work out? Um, so that's where kind of things are going. Um, yeah. yeah. And we have, a, we have a, 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 a lecture on it in September. So if you're interested, make sure to tune in then. So related to that, though, yeah. is it possible that, you know, since the women who may um, be more on, like, the Asperger side of autism mm -hmm. aren't getting diagnosed, then yes. it also means they're not involved in the genetic studies as well. So then, like, you're not looking at the genetic markers on that. So what to do you think on that? Totally right. So the, other, so the other question is, when we think about this from a diagnostic perspective, right, what does it mean if, uh, if we're if we're somehow missing girls, right? So that's the other big question. And we don't, there's actually no way yet for us to answer that um, uh, unless, unless you could take a large population base and you have a particular set of questionnaires and you apply the same criteria and that sort of thing. But it's still tricky. What has been found when we look at um, girls, like say on, the, on a playground, um, uh, generally girls with autism tend to, tend to have other compensatory skills that sort of mask those challenges. So, Girls with the research section that girls with autism who still meet diagnostic career tend to tend to have some compensatory skills that boys don't seem to to carry. So, so your point is totally salient. That's, again, that's so the molecular side is one, one way to look at it. We have to think about um, the diagnostic label we have is based in our cultural perspective. It's based in a, uh, kind of a whole slew of our understanding of autism is based predominantly on boys. And so, if you think about work that was done 20, 30 years ago, all about boys with autism, that's kind of how we conceptualize what autism is. Maybe it's something different for girls, we just don't know. So that's why there's a lot of excitement about it. Great point. The right way to uh, talk to people. I was taught uh, person first, and it was like, um, right. he's got autism, and then I'm hearing autistics. Mm -hmm. Right. So. Um, you know, like anything, it depends on the individual preference. Most of us I know prefer autistic. Um, the two or three research articles I've seen that looks at this um, also show that the majority of us do prefer autistic or on spectrum. Um, m I think it was something like 20% of us preferred, um, you know, person first, so like person with autism. Um, most of the ones who supported like person first were the parents or professionals. So it goes back into like, what type of knowledge is valued around autism? Is it our lived experience or is it like the discourse in, you know, the medical, you know, medical books and all that. And so that's like a source of tension um, that exists right now. So it would be like the parents more than the, the child. Yeah, usually. Okay. 
Uh, question two is, I, I, I was at a PTA meeting, got here for the last half hour. Gentleman in the neckties, what, uh, <laughs> two, two things that I should uh, take away tonight that were presented in the first hour. Hmm. Well, oh yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. That was a that was a brilliant answer. Yeah, it was. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, I'll start. Yeah. I mean, I think Great. that that um, there's a legitimate concern that the supports the the agencies who provide supports are not able to do their job. VVR, DVA. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that there's there's worry. That, uh, that, that those funds are either getting, ru ru uh, they're not being uh, allocated. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the, the one of the, the things that we didn't mention was that there, you know, heard this from, uh, you know, what, former director of DVA, was that the idea is that the, eco the, the economy is supposed to drive ADA supports and we don't, you know, so, so that's why we're getting rid of you know the waiver-based uh, you know behavior supports. So um, so there is there is concerns about whether that's going to be effective or not or not, mm -hmm. and um, and I think that worry is is something that we need to to transfer into action around uh, what are we going to do mm -hmm. about these things? What what happens if DVR you know stops providing uh, vocational training? How does that you know, it's already 80%. Like how could it get any worse than that, right? So, uh, so I think that that would be one of the, that's the takeaway for me from last mm -hmm. year. And as Gary said, I think we're optimists mm -hmm. here mm -hmm. and we have to look, we have to be optimistic that 2018 is going to be better than 2017. Uh, so, and we're going to keep promoting that and keep advocating for what we feel is appropriate, adequate services for everybody. That was a great summary of the key pieces. <laughs> How about on the science side? Yeah, well, I want to hear oh. a science thing. Oh. It seems like there's a lot of genetic stuff that I just didn't even understand. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, the quick take on. Yeah, we uh, we actually oh, we didn't even touch base about SNPs, but we could talk about those. I mean, we just sort of lightly talked about it. Um, so, all right, the quick summary I would say would be that. Uh, we are, I think we are on the cusp of thinking about precision medicine approaches when we think about autism by understanding uh, the biology that's contributing to some of the challenges. And then we can figure out ways to support individuals uh, most effectively. I think we're getting close to there. So I would say that's, that's the quick take home. <laughs> and I okay. think that's the signal that we are done. <laughs> okay. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, guys. Thanks, everyone online. <laughs>